What people call evil takes many shapes. Throughout history, we have tried to understand where it comes from and why it strikes when it does. Many take precautions to avoid contact with the dark force, while there are those who embrace it with enthusiasm. Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. On this program, we'll examine a place, an object, and a person who are associated with the concept of evil. First, Highway 666, a road so steeped in suffering it's known simply as the Devil's Highway. Then a man in Scotland traces the bad luck in his life to a car with the license plate 666. And finally, we'll meet a mother who joins the Church of Satan after meeting its charismatic founder, Anton LaVey. There are many who believe the devil is a real force in the world, but is he better understood as a character, manufactured by man, to account for the unexplained? For many, 666 is a sure signal of Satan's power. To superstitious travelers along this highway, those three numbers practically guarantee a strange and dangerous trip. It runs 200 miles through the Four Corners region of Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico, slicing right through the Navajo Nation reservation. Many Native Americans say the road's haunted by so-called skinwalkers or ghosts. Locals claim it's cursed and do their best to steer clear. From a string of gruesome car accidents during the 1970s and 80s to a killer virus that swept through the community in 1993, the so-called Devil's Highway has gained a fearsome reputation. Some believe the region's fate was sealed when the pavement for the highway was laid in the 1930s and named as the sixth road to cross Route 66. I always thought it was really strange that someone would put that number on a road. Who in their right mind would label a highway 666? Who would do that? The original reference to 666 is found in the last book of the New Testament, Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. Let him who has understanding reckon the number of the beast for it is a human number. Its number is 666. Over the centuries, the passage has been interpreted in various ways. Nonetheless, the number 666 has come to symbolize the Antichrist. And to many, it is a sure sign that evil and destruction are lurking nearby. Many people, including myself, would think it'd be great if they just changed the name of the highway, if that would help solve some of the deaths and some of the problems and the perceptions that people have here. Locals call it El Camino del Diablo, the Devil's Highway, and it certainly lived up to its image during the spring of 1998. On Friday, May 29th, just after 9 a.m., the people of Cortez, Colorado, were going about their morning routine. Good morning. This is KTN News. I'm Bernadette Chato. Officer Dale Claxton was on patrol when he spotted three men in a water truck that had been reported stolen. They were heading towards Highway 666. The officer called for backup and flipped on his lights. I'm behind that southbound on 27, about a half mile north of H. He's pulling over. I'm going to contact him here. Gen 4, 924. What's your location? Protest. What's your location? Okay, 
There was no further communication from Officer Claxton. When he pulled behind the water truck, a passenger stepped out and opened fire with a semi-automatic weapon. He walked down the side of the, the water truck out in the front of Dale's vehicle, uh, shot uh, 19 times through the front window, uh, walked around and shot 10 times through the side window. Claxton was killed instantly in the hail of gunfire. The shooter quickly got back into the truck and sped off. Within minutes, Cortez police officers, Montezuma County sheriffs, and Colorado state troopers rushed to the scene to intercept the water truck. By then, the suspects had pulled into a driveway and piled into a flatbed pickup after holding up its owner. Their next victim, Deputy Sheriff Jason Bishop, didn't even know what hit him. Jason Bishop drove his patrol car past the driveway where the water truck had gone. They pulled out behind him and opened fire on him from the behind, um, striking Jason in the back of the head. After shooting Bishop, the threesome raced down the county road at high speed, firing at any police car they encountered. Then they met up with Montezuma County Detective Sergeant Todd Martin. From around this curve, I seen this orange and white uh, pickup truck that was traveling extremely fast. I just knew that this was a suspect vehicle. Officer Martin spun his wheel and pulled into a nearby driveway. When I rolled out of my car, I closed the door behind me. Just before I stuck my head up over the hood, uh, it just opened up with uh, automatic rifle fire. Once again, the men in the pickup fled the scene, leaving Detective Martin crumpled on the ground with serious injuries. The police finally had a fix on the truck. They pursued the gunman's vehicle as it headed towards the Devil's Highway. But the suspects were one step ahead. Only half a mile after crossing 666, the orange and white pickup truck vanished. This is KTN News. A Cortez, Colorado police officer was shot and killed today after pulling over a truck suspected of being stolen. The word spread quickly through the Four Corners area. One officer dead, two others seriously injured. Locals were panicked. No one knew who the gunmen were or what they wanted, and everyone wondered if they'd be back. Many residents of the Southwest are convinced that Highway 666 and the communities that it crosses are cursed. They half expect strange things to happen here. On May 29, 1998, a routine arrest turned deadly when three gunmen in a stolen vehicle opened fire outside Cortez, Colorado, killing one police officer and injuring two others. Police and state troopers gave chase, but the three men managed to bewilder their pursuers and disappear in a canyon, leaving behind only the vehicle they fled in. Once we didn't find them the first day, um, I, I knew that we were in for a long haul and uh, continue to be in for a long haul. And I think the only thing that's, that's on our side is we've got more time than they do. Local authorities wasted no time calling on the federal government and neighboring jurisdictions for help. Hundreds of law enforcement officers, SWAT teams, and the FBI swarmed on the scene within a couple of hours. They speculated that the men had passed through McElmo Canyon and continued on to Utah's Cross Canyon. Police combed the area. We used helicopters, we used fixed wing aircraft, we used tracking dogs, we used human trackers. The search was fruitless. It seemed that police were hunting for shadows for the first 24 hours. They didn't know the identities of their suspects, let alone a motive for their crimes. 
Finally, they got a break. Authorities in southern Colorado say a tip from a disgruntled girlfriend led police to the identities of three suspects named in last Friday's fatal shooting of Cortez policeman Dale Claxton. One of the suspect's ex-girlfriends was able to provide authorities with the identities of the wanted men. Jason McVean, Robert Mason, and Alan Pylon. All three had grown up in the area and knew the rocky terrain near Devil's Highway only too well. We chased them into their own backyard, and, and they know the area. They've been there. They've uh, backpacked in that area for years and years. Despite identifying their prey, the FBI and local authorities still weren't able to track them down. No one could begin to explain why the men had been driving through the middle of Cortez, Colorado, armed to the hilt in a stolen truck. Anxious residents and interested observers, including renowned mystery writer and New Mexico resident Tony Hillerman, came up with all kinds of theories. What the devil were they stealing a water truck for? Well, I don't know, and no one else knows. Some people believe they were going to fill it up full of something or other and blow up a dam. Other people say, no, they were going to go rob the Ute Mountain Casino. For six days and nights, police searched for some sign of McVean, Pylon, and Mason. They found nothing. Then on June 4th, one of the suspects, Robert Mason, came out of hiding on the banks of the San Juan River in Bluff, Utah. He shot and wounded a sheriff's deputy, then inexplicably surrounded himself with ammunition and took his own life. The other two remained at large. Navajo police say the armed fugitives are believed to be on the Navajo reservation in the Bluff, Utah area. To this day, the remaining fugitives have not been found. Occasional sightings by locals on the Navajo Reservation lead authorities to believe that they are out there, somewhere. A couple uh, of our sightings have been uh, visual. Uh, a uh, a non-Indian walking out of a canyon, very ragged looking, long hair, uh, has a pack on, has an obvious rifle barrel sticking out of the pack. However, those sightings and even a $300,000 FBI reward have brought the police no closer to the two killers. Most believe they're still hiding out somewhere in the craggy canyons that flank Highway 666. We're in for the long haul. There's no give up, I mean, until this thing is brought to some kind of conclusion. We either find their bones or their bodies or, or get them. How were the Cortez killers able to essentially vanish in thin air? The question troubles many locals who are convinced that Highway 666 and the communities that border it are cursed. This region has a rich history of harboring outcasts. Native Americans were able to evade capture during the 1860s by hiding in the rocks. In the late 1880s, Butch Cassidy ran from U.S. Marshals, supposedly taking refuge in the hills here. Many suspect that Cortez fugitives McVean and Pylon followed in these footsteps and have managed to conceal themselves from their pursuers. If you can find a place where you can get food and water, and there's places you can do that, springs and stuff, uh, uh, you're not likely to run into much traffic because the pinyon jays don't call 911 and report seeing you, you know, and, and neither do the bears. Members of the police force that have been tracking the two gunmen since May 1998 agree. They insist the road is no more evil than any other highway. Triple six to me is just another road number, just like 89 or 87 or 64. Uh, they're all road numbers. Why it happened, I don't know. Why they haven't been caught is way beyond me. I would say this, the investigation has been cursed. Local officials point out that the manhunt has been plagued by problems from the start. With the federal government, four states, the Navajo Nation, 
and several towns and counties involved. Insiders say that bureaucracy is hampering the investigation. In addition, people have been reluctant to report sightings out of fear. There's probably a good chance that it, it'll never be resolved, never have a uh, ending to it. It'll just be one of those mysteries that will always be there. But to believers, the disappearance of the Cortez killers is just one more example of the supernatural events that have been cropping up along this stretch of road for years. Many Native Americans claim that so-called skinwalkers roam along the highway, assuming any form they wish to stalk their prey. Navajo tribe members used to prepare for war by dressing in animal skins and masks. In special ceremonies, these skinwalkers put curses on their enemies. I've heard great skinwalker stories. People who say they've looked out the window and there's a skinwalker running along beside their pickup wanting them to stop. I have some officers that do believe in him and uh, they hesitate to take a call down there, which I don't blame. It's something that's in their, in their belief. According to local legend, the road never received a proper Navajo blessing. Some feel the construction of Highway 666 disrupted the natural order of the region and as a result, invited a slew of problems, most notably car accidents. In the early 1980s, more than 100 people were killed along Highway 666. Over one third of the fatalities were pedestrians. Most think these deaths should be attributed to poor design and human error, not to supernatural causes. In the late 70s, early 80s, the road was in pretty poor shape. That combination of a narrow road, fast traffic, and people on the shoulder uh, resulted in a lot of fatalities. Engineers say the road was never intended to handle the volume of traffic that it does today. Construction crews are currently widening the highway and they've added streetlights along the most populated stretches. In addition, many of the deaths on Highway 666 have been the result of a different sort of curse, drunk driving. At this present time, and for a number of years, um, you've not been able to purchase alcoholic beverages legally on the reservation. So people who come to the city to purchase alcohol consume it, and they consume it irresponsible, and then back on the highway again, oftentimes intoxicated, Maybe everybody that's explaining that road's dangers are right. It's haunted by witches, and uh, it's a bad road used by drunks. So take your pick. And I think I'll take a mixture of both. The Work of the Devil. Some see it as tragedy full of death and destruction. Others view it as comedy, a playful, manipulative force waiting to pounce on the unsuspecting. One Scottish man blames the devil for his collision with bad luck. He's pretty certain his car was running on something more sinister than gasoline. In 1993, Ken's story appeared to be on the road to success. The 33-year-old had a happy marriage, a young daughter, and was doing well financially. He owned a small glass framing business in Glasgow and worked part-time at a neighborhood pub. To celebrate his prosperity, Ken decided to purchase a new car. After shopping around, he found exactly what he was looking for, a used, souped-up, blue escort. The dealer seemed strangely eager to make a sale. I was wondering why the chap initially when, when he sold me the car, uh, when I went up to him, uh, he was quite willing to quite readily knock that 200 pounds off. The plate number of Ken's new car? B666 MSC. Ken's friends told him he was courting danger. 
Buying a car with the dreaded sign of the devil on its license plate? When Ken first bought the car, uh, we all said to him, no, no way, don't touch it, Ken. Uh, but he seemed to not didn't really to bother about it. He was he's such a laid back guy, he just goes, well, nothing will happen, and just went ahead and bought it. At that time in the United Kingdom, a license number was assigned to a car when it was originally purchased and stayed with it, regardless of changes in ownership. Ken shrugged off his friend's warnings. But within six months of making the purchase, his luck began to change. It started with the local police repeatedly pulling him over. Every time they passed the police car, they always either gave it a glance or pulled him over. And that began to annoy me, knowing that I hadn't done anything, but we were getting picked on. Despite the unwanted attention he drew from the police, Ken loved his car. Maybe a little too much. Ken started living life in the proverbial fast lane. He gained a reputation as the man with the devil car. During the day, he spent more time driving through the countryside than he did at his job. And he stayed out late, cheating on his wife. It wasn't long before Sandra and his friends caught on. And it was so easy for them to track me down and find out what I was up to because it, the car was so unique and it was, was so easy to spot. Uh, so all my shenanigans uh, was getting harder because uh, you just couldn't hide this car. Tired of Ken's running around, Sandra kicked him out of the house. As if things weren't bad enough, Ken's business began to falter soon after that. And then one morning, to Ken's disbelief, he woke to learn that his 666 mobile had been stolen. The police told Ken not to expect to see it again. Three days later, the car was recovered in front of the police station, undamaged. It was as if thieves had changed their minds about stealing it. Either something scared them off or someone scared them off, uh, but for the car to be found perfectly parked in a quite a respectable area, close to a police station, uh, is about weird. With the car back in his possession, Ken's bad luck persisted. Parking tickets started arriving in the mail. Ken paid the fines, even though he didn't remember getting the violations in the first place. Ken investigated the situation after receiving a half dozen notices. He found out that the person who bought his old car had failed to put the vehicle in his name and was parking it illegally all over Glasgow. Ken's discovery came a little too late. A warrant was issued for his arrest. When he went to the courthouse to straighten out the problem, he was thrown in jail. After spending 10 hours in a cell, the confusion was cleared up and Ken was finally free to go. I uh, thought, well, how the hell did I get out of this? Not not just the, the car the car mess, it was like the business mess, uh, the marriage mess, uh, the whole whole thing was just uh, crumbling around about my ears. Ken's company went belly up only a few weeks after the jail incident. He turned to his family and his friends, who told him the only solution to his woes was to get rid of that damned car. Couldn't handle it anymore. I think he started to regret having anything to do with the car. Eventually, peer pressure from friends, colleagues, family, everyone uh, told me to basically see sense and get rid of the car. Ken decided to trade it in. He hoped that his life would return to normal as soon as he got rid of license plate number B666MSC. On the day of the trade, Ken drove his car to the dealership for what he thought was his last drive in the so-called devil car. And I was probably less than 100 yards away from the garage, which I was due to then. And this woman cut in front of me and I just plowed straight into the back of her. There wasn't a mark on the other car, but Ken's escort was totaled. The dealer, of course, took one look at the escort and refused to make the trade. To make matters worse, 
Ken had let his insurance lapse in anticipation of the trade-in. If he had been in the accident just two hours earlier, he would have been insured. The only way he was able to finally get rid of the car was to sell it to a friend to rebuild. I said to him uh, to take out a large insurance policy on it. Ken says his luck changed almost immediately. First, he was promoted at his part-time pub job. Then he and his wife reconciled and the following year had a second daughter. Ken's story is grateful that his string of misfortunes are behind him. And he says he'll do just about anything to escape another run-in with the number 666. Why does someone like Ken Story believe that an object, like a license plate bearing the number 666, can bring bad luck? Experts say it's common for a person who's already on a path of self-destruction to blame outside forces for their misfortunes. It appears that someone in Ken's situation who might have made some poor decisions, maybe didn't handle success as well as, as they might have, would perhaps want to attribute the misfortunes that they've had to something, again, outside of themselves, as opposed to taking personal responsibility. 666 has become a superstition in our culture. Just as many do their best to avoid walking under ladders or crossing the path of a black cat, some people will go to great extremes to dodge anything that bears those numbers. I don't think it means that at heart we all believe in the devil. I just think it means that we take a view that these things probably don't exist, but it's probably best not to provoke them. Ken's story does accept some responsibility for his six-month ride on the wild side, but he can't help feeling that the 666 on his license plate drove evil into his life. To me, it was just a bad luck number. I will always remember that car. Uh, it's... Uh, I don't think I'll ever forget it. It's not until like, months, years even passing on that you sit back and think all oh, the different bad luck after bad luck. You don't begin to realise, could it possibly have been the 666? Or is it just one of these unexplained things? You might say these people are having a devil of a good time. Their children are tucked safely in bed. Their pagers and cell phones are turned off so they won't be interrupted. At any time now, they'll be calling on their cherished friend. Hail Satan! Hail Satan! Thirty-six-year-old Egraine Gidney was never hell-bent on becoming a Satanist. It's something that crept quietly into her life. Back in 1990, her name was Egraine Dugan, and she felt she needed to make a dramatic change. She was working six days a week, running an occult bookstore 40 miles north of Palm Beach, Florida. She didn't feel she had enough time to spend with her three children, and her husband was never around. Then one day, William Gidney walked into her bookstore. He did manage to show up at a point in my life where I was open to other suggestions, so timing was critical. She immediately recognized the inverted pentagram he wore around his neck. The man was a member of the Church of Satan. Egraine had never met a Satanist before and was curious to know more about him. I assume that Satanists didn't laugh. That Satanists didn't giggle, Satanists didn't find joy, Satanists didn't love. Those stereotypes I was completely guilty of. And meeting William within several weeks, and there wasn't one of those left standing. Eventually, Egraine divorced. In 1991, she married William in a small ceremony. The better Egraine got to know William and his friends from the Church of Satan, the more intrigued she became with the notion of a religion that honors the dark side of humanity. A year after the wedding, 
William was invited to San Francisco to meet the founder of the Church of Satan. Egrain agreed to go with him. On January 9, 1992, Egrain and William paid a visit to the infamous Anton LaVey at his notorious Black House. I remember everything about meeting Dr. LaVey. Everything about it was on a different level. Everything was relaxed, focused, but at the same time there was this undertone of energy that couldn't be denied. Anton LaVey had started his career doing a variety of unusual jobs, playing the organ for carnivals and burlesque houses, taming lions and working as a crime photographer for the police department. He first gained fame as a member of San Francisco's counterculture. Beginning in 1963, a group of eccentrics known as the Magic Circle met once a week at Anton's house to discuss the occult. He started gathering this interesting cadre of people around him and they wanted to explore some of these rituals and some of these sort of uh, offbeat ideas that all of them were coming up with. The weekly topics ranged from vampires and werewolves to magic and ESP. As these gatherings started to grow in size, it became clear to Anton that others were interested in exploring the realm of the unknown. He decided that a church dedicated to Satan would be the perfect outlet. He figured there was no better way to attract attention and cause outrage. On April 30th, 1966, Anton LaVey founded the Church of Satan. He wanted to found the Church of Satan because he knew that it would be offensive to a lot of people. He had a great sense of fun and satire and he liked to play with people's brains. Uh, it wasn't that he wasn't sincere with his philosophy, because he most certainly was, but he also enjoyed the discomfort that people felt at that dreaded S-word. He found it very amusing. Church followers known as Satanists maintain that they don't believe in the devil literally as a supernatural being with cloven hoofs and a tail. Instead, they view the devil as a symbol of defiance. Essentially, Satanists worship themselves. Each person is their own god in Satanism. We choose Satan as a symbol to represent our philosophy because Satan etymologically means the adversary, the accuser, one who opposes or questions. At first, the church only attracted followers from around the Bay Area. Then in 1967, Anton performed a satanic wedding baptism and funeral. The media clamored to cover the events. Overnight, Anton LaVey and his church achieved international notoriety. He was saying things that were dynamic and interesting and, and startling to a lot of people. And uh, he put together these, these sexy, dramatic, enticing images that went with it, and of course journalists came, came knocking at his door. Anton, as the church's highest priest, wrote the Satanic Bible and instituted rituals known as the Black Mass. Open wide the gates of hell and come forth by these names. The ceremonies were full of parody and satire. Anton would light black candles and lead followers in chants to Satan while standing in front of a naked woman serving as the altar. With his public rituals and his blasphemous black messes, Anton gained quite a following. Critics saw him as a media hound, only out to gain publicity for himself. By the time E. Grain and William Gidney met Anton LaVey in 1992, his popularity had waned. Even so, he made an unforgettable impression on E. Grain. I walked into feeling 
that this really didn't mean much to me and walked out of feeling that this was life-changing. And uh, for a long time, not wanting to accept that any one incident could have a profound change on my life, but being unable to dismiss it, it was magic. In 1992, Egraine Gidney and her husband, a confirmed Satanist, took a trip to San Francisco to meet the founder of the Church of Satan, Anton LaVey. Egraine had gone along to support her husband, but she left with a whole new outlook. She says she discovered that she identified with the satanic philosophy and slowly began to embrace the devil. Adopting the satanic archetype, the archetype of the accuser, the opposer, that which is against stagnation, that which questions the status quo, that already fit with who I was. And therefore, it was a very natural adopting of. Egraine was a native of New York City. Her parents, she says, were both atheists who encouraged her to make up her own mind about religion. In college, she studied anthropology and history. As an adult, she finally found comfort in the way Satanists challenged standard religious beliefs and realized that she shared most of their views, including the belief that some people are naturally superior to others. Satanists don't see anything as being equal. We see the entire realm of existence being hierarchical, and that specifically includes people. Over the next couple of years, Egraine adopted what she describes as a crucial tenet of Satanism, to devote time and energy only to things that are important to oneself. She spent time with her family and built up her occult shop. In November 1997, she decided to send away for an official membership application to the Church of Satan. I pondered over becoming a member and thought about it for many years, many, many years. But the decision to join the Church of Satan was based completely on suddenly I had something to bring to the table. And when that day came, I, without reservation, sent my application in. Now that she's a full-fledged member of the church, Egraine participates in satanic rituals. Hail Satan! On the altar is a young woman, her head pointing to the south and her feet to the north. Every salutation to Satan is punctuated with a gong. A sword is used to summon the Prince of Hell. The Church of Satan does not advocate abusing children or animals or performing blood sacrifice. They do, however, put curses on enemies, purge feelings of anger and hatred, and ask the devil for special favors. There's nothing about ritual that I don't enjoy. Every step of the way, every bit of preparation is actually part of the psychodrama, the putting on of the robes, the lighting of the candles. I do not recall any specific moment in time when my wife made the great transition to that of a Satanist. She simply adopted a title who described who and what she was already to me as her friend and husband. Egraine says that she has finally found happiness. She and William have two children of their own, and she insists that her religion and her parenting are compatible. Egraine requested that her children not be photographed for this story. Being a parent and being a Satanist, in many ways, again, is no different from anyone else. Like all parents, I love my children, and nothing in this world would get in my way in the care for them. Why would someone like Egraine Gidney wish to align herself with the devil? Hail Satan! Experts explain that first and foremost, like any other organization, the Church of Satan offers its members a sense of belonging. There are very often people who somehow feel that society has, has 
dealt them a dirty trick, has has not recognised their gifts or has pushed them to the margins, has treated them as peculiar in some way. So they have a grudge against society and they exercise that grudge by what they see as the ultimate act of rebellion, by embracing a belief system that goes against everything that society stands for. I think the sad part about all of this is that their affirmation, if you will, of the Prince of Darkness or Satan depends entirely on people embracing a notion of the good. That is, it's an entirely derivative business. Those who embrace the notion of the good don't really need evil, but those who are drawn toward evil actually require some notion of the good as something they're not. Satan. The Church of Satan isn't the only organization that aligns itself with the devil. Lucifer. Observers generally agree that most of its members are non-violent. There are other satanic groups, however, with varying philosophies and ideals. And some individuals have committed brutal acts and blamed the devil for their crimes. Throughout history, the devil has always attracted people who were on the margins of society. The devil really was the first revolutionary. He was the first person who kind of broke out of the cosy citadel and, and made trouble outside. So radicals, rebels, are always attracted to the first revolutionary. Ever since the Middle Ages, when Christians refined the image of the devil, it has been denounced for society's ills. Some scholars argue that the concept of evil, no matter how one chooses to define it, is necessary to explain tragedies like war, genocide, and violent crime. How else are we going to talk about that, you know, if we, if we lose the language of, of good and evil? I think that you could point to some events or situations and say, that's the face of evil, that's how uh, that's how evil has manifested itself among us. If you're looking for the source of bad things that happen in your life, and as a society, if we're looking for the source of bad things that happen to us as, as a group, we have to start off by looking within ourselves. Don't encourage people to try and put the blame on some external scapegoat with horns and sulfur breath and scaly skin. It's just silly, facile and, and out of date. Volperga. Volperga. Satanists agree that people should take responsibility for their own actions. They claim that's one of the guiding principles they live by. And while few could argue with that, many do find fault with some of the other tenets they subscribe to. Take, for example, the 11th so-called satanic rule of the earth. It says, when walking in public, bother no one. If someone bothers you, ask them to stop. If they do not stop, destroy them. Now, that may seem harsh when phrased, but if you really inquire, most people will say, well, that makes complete and utter sense. That's exactly what I do. To some, such a philosophy may seem amoral. In our modern era, of course, there are no strict guidelines anymore about what constitutes evil. Some think it's high time we reclaim the meaning of that word. I think it's important that we recapture um, some notions of what lies beneath that name so we don't use it carelessly and we don't use it recklessly and that we use it appropriately in order to capture what's going on and to think about the world and our part in it. In almost every religious tradition, evil is a word used to describe the unspeakable and the profane. In the modern world, evil can be a very slippery concept, of course. For the fundamentalist, evil is a force as real as gravity, and the devil and his mark are the cause of the world's suffering. From this perspective, one could only wonder what might happen to the Church of Satan on Judgment Day. Would heaven take it as a joke? Or would Anton LaVey find eternity far warmer than he could ever have imagined?